thank you, and hello, everybody. Uh, my talk is about, um, as Matt said, about continuous integration. Uh, a few words about me. I'm a Python web developer since uh, more than uh, 10 years, and uh, most of my professional and free time I spend on a project uh, called Plone. It's an open source enterprise content management system uh, written in Python. Uh, we have around 340 uh, core developers worldwide, and uh, Plone powers websites like uh, NASA, CIA, NSA, Oxfam, Brazilian government, and many more. Um, and since around four years, I'm uh, the uh, leader of the Plone continuous integration and testing team. So we make sure that our continuous integration systems work and that our testing is in a good shape. Um, so what's continuous integration? Um, I guess everybody heard that term um, at some point, uh, and it's um, in contrast to what many people think that it's like a software that you can just install and then you do continuous integration. It's actually a software development practice, like test-driven development, for instance. Um, so this software development practice um, is about team members that integrate their work into a main branch of a version control system uh, frequently. And each of these integration or commits or, push or pushes or whatever is verified by an automated build and test process. And this automated build and test process makes sure that um, code violations, test failures, uh, or bugs are detected as early um, as possible and also reported as early as possible to your developers. Uh, we all know that um, this, those statistics about bugs, right? That the later you detect bugs, the more uh, cost they cause, right? So if we detect bugs early, it, they're easy to, to, uh, to track down and easier to fix. Um, and one of the other um, advantages, big advantages of a continuous integration system is that if you run your build and your tests automatically on a continuous basis, then you know that your development and um, also your deployment environment is in a working state. Um, so as I said, the, uh, there, are, there are three important parts in continuous integration. One is the first one is that you um, integrate frequently into your um, burden control system, that you have an automated build and test system, and that you report. So um, keep those three items in, in mind because I will uh, come back to that. Our first approach in, in the Plone community to continuous integration was uh, actually BuildBot. Uh, who here knows what BuildBot is? Oh. Quite a few people. So, BuildBot is a continuous integration uh, framework written in Python. Um, we we had it set up, um, but it's it's quite complex. Um, and as I said, it's more a framework than than an out of the box solution. So you can't just like install BuildBot and it will like do everything that you want. You have to really know what you're doing. And it's yeah, it's hard to set up. So we barely used it. I mean, a few hardcore developers uh, used it but it wasn't really run on a continuous uh, basis. It wasn't really integrated into our, into our um, in our burden control setup, um, and nobody really, as, as a like regular developer, you did not even notice or knew about it. And um, around four years ago, in 2011, uh, we introduced Hudson, uh, what's now called Jenkins, uh, into our, uh, into our uh, process. Uh, and one of the developers who like started to play around with uh, Jenkins uh, wrote that it's like BuildBot but with with a butler. So um, in comparison to BuildBot, Jenkins is really an out of out of the box solution. You just install it, and you configure. You have to configure it a bit, but then it it basically works. Uh, so that that was really nice. Also, Jenkins comes with a with a nice user interface, so everybody can just go there and like check the status and stuff like that. Um, downside is, is it's written in Java, and as a, as a Python developer, you, you always prefer, of course, to use a beautiful Python software, right? Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, Java is a decent language, and it's, uh, it's a very good, um, good software product, in my opinion. It has a huge open source community um, around it uh, with, many, when, with many plugins. Um, it's backed by a, by a company who offers uh, uh, commercial services on top of that called CloudBeast. Uh, and we are really, really happy with it. So, uh, during my talk, I will um, give you examples uh, what we do with with Jenkins, um, but it's not very specific to to Jenkins. So, as I said, continuous integration is a is a um, software development practice. So, it's about the practice and the rules that you have, right? It's not about the the, the software that you actually choose. So, when we um, moved from BuildBot to Hudson, things looked a bit better. 
Um, but we, we use nightly builds. I guess a lot of people uh, do that because your, your tests take quite a while um, and you don't want to run them on every commit for whatever reason. And then you run them on a nightly basis, right? If everybody sleeps, then you can just run them for a couple of hours or whatever it takes. And next morning, you will uh, get a report to your mailing list saying those, this is the list of, of commits and uh, now the build is either broken or uh, it's fine. Um, the problem with that is that you don't run your build for each integration. If you, if you recall the definition that I gave you up front about continuous integration, the important part is that you run your build and test process for each commit because that's the only way uh, to figure out which commit or which code change actually caused uh, regression, right? If you, if you have 20 um, commits from different people and next morning you, you will see, hey, the build is, is red, then somebody needs to clean that up. And usually the person who cleans that up is not the person who causes the violation, so it's costly to do that, right? And nobody does that. If, if you are in a company, you can force somebody, like a poor guy or girl, to like fix the, fix the stuff for other people, but in open source communities, it's even harder because like there are 20 commits and, and people say, hey, it wasn't me, right? My, my commit was really like clean and, and perfect. So if you run them on a nightly basis, your build is broken 99% of the time. That, that's, that's at least my, my experience. Um, so our software like development and release process in the Plone community was like this. The build was like broken 99% of the time. And then before a release, our release manager said, hey, guys, I want to make a release. And then like two or three of the 340 developers, the really hardcore guys, started to like fix um, tests for everybody else. Sometimes we had like 400 or 500 test failures. We have around 9,000 tests in, in Plone. So people really, we sat together like for a day or two and we really fixed like a couple of hundred bucks before we could even make, make a release. And then we started to make our 300 releases and then our release manager could make the actual release, right? So that's what it took when we had those nightly builds. Um, so how could we um, solve that nightly build problem? Um, you can solve that by uh, following the rule that you have one build and test per commit. So how do you do that? By default, Jenkins um, use, uh, use polling to poll the, the version control system. Like you can set it to every 30 seconds or something and it polls it and if a new commit is there, it creates a build. The problem with that is you, you won't fetch all the, you, you will not get one build per commit because it could be that some, like two people commit at the same time, then you have like two commits. And believe me, those two people will say it was the other one. Always. So uh, you have one commit and you make sure that you have one build for that commit. That with with uh, today's uh, version control system, that's really easy because GitHub has post commit hooks. Uh, if, you, if you host it on GitHub or Bitbucket or on your own, you have your own uh, Git repository, you can just uh, create a Git uh, post commit hook that actually triggers your, your Jenkins instance or your CI instance and then you can have one build. Um, per commit, so you can trace the person or the commit that was responsible, so it's really easy to figure out what, what goes wrong. Uh, in Plone, it's a bit more complex than that because we have those 300 packages and one checkout does not mean we have like the, the exact same checkout of all packages, but I will like come to that later. Um, and then what's important is that you preserve this commit information um, through your continuous integration pipeline. So you pass it through the builds and also um, so that you can at the end notify people, right? Via email or anything else. So uh, we have those uh, three steps, commit, build, notify. And um, in order to be able to automatically build and test your software, you need an automated build. So we have uh, tools for that in the Python community, right? Uh, in Plone, we use build out. It's not widely used outside the Zoop community. The permit folks use it. Um, but most people use pip or easy install, which are also fine. You, need, you probably need to like wrap them, wrap them in, into, a, um, uh, into a bash files or anything like that. Um, but you can automate your build, right? If you, if you do that, you can use talks, for instance, on the CI system to, uh, to configure uh, what's run on the, on the CI system. And on, on the Jenkins machine, you can um, for instance, use uh, tools like Shining Panda. That's a, a, a Jenkins plugin that allows you to create virtual ends or uh, build outs and install things via pip automatically. 
So it's just a convenience tool. We are not using it in the Plum community because a bash script is enough. But um, if you want to do stuff with Python and you want a nice wrapper, then Shining Panda is the is the right tool for the job. So if you build, um, yeah, if you do your build automatically, you all you all of course want to use uh, you want to run your tests, right? Because you want to make sure that your software actually works. Um, if you use PyTest, you're lucky because you can just uh, configure PyTest to um, to output um, files that Jenkins can read out of the box. Jenkins is it's Java software, so it has, of course, an XML uh, interface. Um, but uh, with PyTest, it's really easy. Um, I'm not sure about other uh, Python test frameworks. We have Collective XML Test Report, which is the Plone um, uh, wrapper about the, about the Zulp test run. I won't bother you with that. Um, and then you can present those nice uh, statistics about uh, your failing or passing tests. And the same is true for uh, test coverage. So you can use uh, uh, the coverage package and the Jenkins Cobertura plugin to actually show that uh, to your users so you have a nice interface that you also can show to your project manager so he or she can, can track your performance and see if the build uh, is broken. Um, in order to make sure that your software is not only in a working state but also does what it's supposed to do, you, you usually need acceptance tests, right? And uh, I'm a web developer, so what, what you usually do is you write Selenium tests. And we, we used that in the Plum community for a long time. But around five years ago, we started with Robot Framework. And that really gave us a boost when it came to uh, acceptance testing. Uh, Robot Framework is a generic test framework um, with multiple plugins. And one of those plugins is Jenkins, uh, is, sorry, <laughs> is uh, Selenium, Selenium 2. So you can uh, write tests in this nice B BDD uh, syntax, uh, human readable, not, not only by programmers. And uh, Robot Framework and Selenium will run those tests. And you have all the integration necessary um, in Jenkins as well. So you have a, a Robot Framework um, plugin in Jenkins or, or a Selenium, Selenium 2 plugin that, um, that shows you all the nice outputs of Robot Framework or Selenium. The cool thing about Robot Framework is that it gives you a full trace back. If your tests fail, you, you, it goes uh, step by step through it and it it does an automatic um, screenshot of the last, w where the test actually failed, and you have all that in a nice output that you can access and, and see what, what failed, right? Um, and we are, we are also using a, a Source Labs, which is a software service that you can use to actually run your um, robot framework or Selenium test on different versions. So they offer you all the, all the versions that you could imagine um, because you don't want to set up your own uh, Windows machine. We tried it, don't do it. That those, those services are cheap, sorry for the advertising, but, or use any other service, but use a service, don't do that yourself, we tried it. Um, then one, one thing that is, that is especially important uh, for Python because it's a dynamically typed language is uh, static code analysis, so you're able to, uh, to track possible bugs early. I guess you're all familiar with, with, the, with the tools, pep8, pyflex, pylint, uh, we created a, a, a wrapper in the Plone community around those tools called Plone Recipe Code Analysis to, to have our best practice testable. Um, you can use that without Plone, but only within build out. Um, and you can present all those, if, if you run those code analysis um, uh, scripts, you can present them uh, within the Jenkins violations plugin, and it gives you also nice statistics about uh, all your violations, uh, not only for Python, but also uh, JSLint and all the modern stuff, CSSLint. Uh, it's, all, it's all pluggable into the violations plugin. So you can really, really easily present um, all the information that you have um, to, to your developers or to your project managers or every, everybody involved. Um, then one of the things that is really important is notifications because people need to be informed as quickly as possible about regressions. Um, and there are like many different ways you can do that in, in, in Jenkins. The best way or the way that is most widely used is uh, via email and there's an uh, extended email plugin for Jenkins that allows you to um, define rules uh, which people uh, you want to notify. So you can say if the build breaks, then I want to notify like this, this mailing list and that, and if the build is, uh, is still failing, then I want to do this and that. Um, so, it's, so you can really like uh, define all the all the rules that you want. Usually, if you have a larger organization, you want to hook it hook it hook, uh, hook Jenkins up with with LDAP, 
Um, it also com comes with a plugin uh, for, for GitHub, for instance, or Bitbucket, so you can you use the authentication with that. That's, that's really nice. That's the cool thing about Jenkins, that it has such a huge community that, that you have plugins for everything. Um, and you, want, uh, you also want to show um, the current status to your users. So uh, you can use the Jenkins dashboard plugin to, to have a nice dashboard, or you can even build your custom front ends. Um, it's all there, you just have to choose. Um, so in the Plum community, we, we set up everything that I just presented to you, um, and we ended up uh, with this still. So why is that? I mean, we put lots of effort with a lot of people into that, and we build it all like by the book, and the build was still broken. Why, why, is, why is that, right? I mean, there are two reasons, actually. One, one of the reasons is that in, for Plone, it's hard to have this one commit, one build thingy, because we have those 300 packages, and if you do a checkout, then it checks out those up to 300 packages, and you can't be sure that this all happens uh, in a time frame before somebody else comes along, right? So that's pretty specific, so I won't go into that detail, but that's a problem. As soon as you have like two people that could be responsible for something, they will point to each other and say it was the other one, right? That's always the case. And then like the, the continuous integration and testing team needs to clean up and figure out what went wrong, and after that you can like point at those persons and, and say, hey, it was you, but uh, I had to clean up your stuff anyways. Uh, but the second thing that is not specific to, to Plone is that people break the build and they just don't care. I mean, it's not because they're evil. Sometimes you, you just want to do like a quick fix or anything, or you do a commit and you think that can't possibly break anything, right? I just did that uh, like two days ago. And, and like, like a good friend of mine then just, it took him like two or three hours to, um, to fix my stuff because it wasn't obvious because the commit really looks perfect and then he wrote in the git in the github commit commit message that he wants to kill me uh, <laughs> it was like all my fault because i was tired and i just went to bed instead of like waiting for for jenkins to pass so so it's not bad people but sometimes those things happen right you break the build maybe you don't check your emails or anything our build takes uh, still uh, around 40 uh, minutes uh, so people break the build so how, how do you present, uh, prevent that? Um, as I said like a couple of times before, continuous integration is a development uh, practice. So what's, what's maybe even more essential than a good um, software that helps you with that is actually that you practice that, that you have agreement on a team. And I think we gained a lot of experience with that because we have like those 340 core developers that's actually from our last year's conference in, in Brazil. Um, we have over half a million lines of code. We have over 300 uh, core packages. So we have quite a complex uh, software and like a huge team of developers. Um, it's not like a company where you can tell somebody to do things, right? So we need some agreement on the team how to like keep a green build. Fortunately, um, some smart people already thought about that. Uh, and came up with a few continuous integration uh, rules or best practices that allow you to keep a green build. Uh, the most important one is do not check in on a broken build. It's, the most important one is not do not break the build because that will not happen. People will break the build and it's okay to break the build. It's just important that you don't check in on a broken build because if the build is broken and somebody else comes in and checks in, then it, things get complex. You get more test failures and you can't figure out which commit was responsible and then people will point at each other and say it was that guy and it wasn't me, right? And then things will become complex. So what you should do if you break the build, the team should stop, the entire team should stop and start fixing the build because you have a real regression, right? Your software is not in a working state and nobody can commit if they take this first rule um, seriously. So the team should stop and work on that. Sometimes that's not happening, if uh, that's not working, then it's also fine to just revert your commit. Sometimes it's obvious what you can do to fix it, then you can just fix it, but there should be a time frame within uh, where you should um, fix the bug within that time frame, right? Because otherwise you will block the build. But if you do that, if you um, uh, uh, stick with those rules, um, you can actually get a green build most of the time, like not 100% of the time because people will still break the build. This is what CI is for, right? Our tests take quite 
a long time to run if you run them all not in parallel like we do on, on the CI system, but uh, sequ sequentially, uh, then it takes more than one and a half hour to run our tests. And you can't expect everybody to run all the, those tests, right? So people should use the CI system to break it, but uh, not for long. Um, so if we go with the continuous integration rules and have our, like, um, our setup, we have, we have proof that our software is in a working state all the time. That is pretty cool for our developers because if developers do a checkout, they know that the software works, right? Before that, they checked it out, wanted to fix something, and they had like a broken build, so they had to fix something else. That's frustrating. We could make faster releases because our release manager did not have to ask the two or three hardcore developers to like fix all those bugs for a day. He, could, he can just make releases because our build is green, right? So you can deploy it any, any time. Um, just a few remarks. Um, about additional things that you could do. Scalability is, is important. Um, you should definitely, if you have a larger project, uh, consider using a, a server node setup for Jenkins, which uh, Jenkins allows you to do. Um, so otherwise, you're, if, you, if you have a lot of jobs running in your Jenkins machine, then your UI will freeze because the server is busy. So do that, um, do that on the nodes. Use provisioning. Uh, there's nothing worse than a CI system that does not work reliably. And behaves differently on the nodes. Uh, and you can use the Jenkins port allocator plugin to run things in parallel, because this is what you want to do. Uh, then if you have your, your CI system in place, uh, the next step would be continuous delivery, not um, continuous integration. With continuous integration, you automate your testing process and your integration process. With continuous deployment, you automate your deployment. The idea is that you, for deployment, you just have to push a button, more or less, and automatically you will like deploy, right? A lot of companies do that these days, and um, Jenkins grew from a CI system to a, actually a system that can do CD as well. Um, and we also started to, to work on that. We're using Zest Releaser, for instance, to do um, Python egg releases. It's an awesome package. If you do egg releases by hand, stop and use Zest Releaser. It's perfect. It's really great. Um, piece of software. You can use DevP, for instance, to make uh, egg releases or wheels releases um, to test then actually your, your deployment. And um, on the Jenkins side, uh, there's a new plugin since like half a year called Jenkins Workflow Plugin. It's really a game changer uh, in, in CI, in my opinion. It allows you to create really sophisticated uh, um, uh, workflows within Jenkins to run uh, certain steps in parallel or sequentially uh, and notify people and it's incredibly flexible. Um, I already played around with it and we definitely um, plan to, to move to it. Um, so if you start with Jenkins, I would like definitely check it out. It's, it's really, really awesome. Uh, so to summarize, um, if you have a CI system and you integrate frequently, you have an automated build and test system for each integration and you report as soon as possible, you can get a green build um, like most of the time. Uh, which gives you um, a proof that you have a, a software in working state that you can deploy at any time. You can ship software uh, faster and better. It's more fun for developers, not frustrating for them because they, they run into like failing tests. Uh, and Jenkins in the last four years has been great. It's, it's like you have plugins for everything. It's, it's a great piece of, piece of software even though it's written in Java. Um, so uh, yeah, use it. Um, if you want to know more about uh, continuous integration, I highly recommend uh, that book on the left side called Continuous Delivery from Jeff Humble and David Fairley. They came up with uh, those continuous integration uh, rules. Um, there's another book called Continuous Integration uh, from the same publisher. I would recommend to, to buy this book because it has everything and the continuous integration chapter in that book is, is really great. I have two, I, I bought two, both of the books and buy this one. You don't need the other one. Um, and on the right side, th this is a blog post. There's also um, below, where the URL is below, where I uh, wrote a blog post about our CI setup uh, with all the uh, um, plugins that we used and all the approaches, so that's more in detail. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to ask me on Twitter, on IRC, um, uh, on my blog. The slides are there. Um, and uh, thank you. Thanks, Timo. We have time for two questions. If there's anyone who has a question for Timo, uh, put your hand up. Thanks. Hi. Um, first, I wanted to say that uh, with nose test, you can also output XML, which can be interpreted by Jenkins and displayed yep. in the web UI. And my question is, uh, what do you do with flaky tests? 
to with flaky tests to flaky test? a, a test that sometimes fail. You can't prevent. Yeah, I mean that's 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 uh, hard to do. What we usually try to do is um, to uh, to make them work reliably, and if they don't work reliably, we remove them. Because personally, I don't think it makes sense to have a test that fails randomly because that does not give you any information. If that if a test fails randomly, it's to no, to no use because if it fails, it gives gives you no information. If it passes, it gives you no information. So uh, we we try really hard to make it work reliably. That's especially important for Selenium tests because the underlying technology is uh, fragile. But you can make it work reliably, and Jenkins helps you a lot with that because if you run things in parallel, then you will see all kinds of effects that you don't see on your local machine. Um, you have to make sure when you run Selenium tests that you uh, um, uh, that you yeah that you make sure that everything is there because uh, tests can run slow and fast, and, and it's not not easy to do. But uh, in my opinion, it's worth the effort to have like reliable tests. Yeah, um, my question was that: um, Could you quickly comment on on how often like developers step on each other's toes when you have so many repositories and developers? Like, uh, does it happen often? Do you regret having split them out instead of having them in one Git, or do you use Git submodules? Could you please comment on these yeah. things? That's that's. The, the big question that we always ask. Does it make, I mean, we, we, we split our, uh, we had a big monolithic software block and we split it onto multiple packages, multi -repo multiple repositories, and it's really great if you can, as a developer, like pick things and improve uh, certain packages without having to download everything, right? So that's, that's a great thing and we don't want to lose that. On the other hand, we see the amount of work that is necessary um, to release and uh, keep track of all those multiple repositories. And we haven't really solved that problem that you have one commit and one, one build. We are close, but we don't have it. So it's a trade-off in the end. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I, I don't think that we will go back to a one repository approach, um, but uh, I can see the, the advantages that you have. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's possible. Yeah, that that's possible. But then you still do a checkout, and then you can't be sure. That's that's basically the same. We are using actually Mr. Developer, which is a tool that checks out all the packages for you and makes sure that you have the right branches. It's pretty sophisticated, pretty cool, but it's complex. And we try to store known good sets of this. So we had for all our 300 packages, we stored the version numbers or. The, uh, the, the, the commit uh, hashes and stuff like that, and we tried to make that reproducible, but it was just too complex. We failed at that. That just did not work. Great, thank you very much, Timo. Great presentation.